Hello, and welcome to episode 14 of Project Slave 1. It's been a while since the last episode, way longer than I'd have liked. There's been a lot going on. As you'll see, I've been going round in circles. Having a stupid cold doesn't help either, so sorry in advance for the audio quality. Eventually, though, I've made enough progress to show you what I've been up to and where Project Slave 1 currently stands. But don't worry, it's all good. In the last episode, you'll have seen the base model of Slave 1 completed. I took the wings, engine and cockpit from my original model and reworked them into an all-new hull. There was quite a lot of modification to these parts to get them to fit within the new hull shape. The overall size was also corrected to match the dimensions of the ILM Studio model. External hull detail was carefully recreated to match the original model as closely as possible. An all new interior was also designed, following on from my original cockpit concept. This new interior runs from nose to tail, allowing the builder to really go to town on their version of Slave 1 when the files are released. So with the CAD files created, I now have to break down Slave 1 into individual component parts for 3D printing. This is pretty straightforward for the wings and underside, which I already had well resolved, but the main hull was a much bigger problem. Most of the interior components could be easily stripped out, to be printed as individual parts. Parts like the armoury, workbench, stowage and carbon freeze chamber were removed leaving the hull bare. This left the main hull, which with its complex curves meant there were no natural breakpoints to divide it up. Here you can see in my photocentric slicer the combination of shapes that make up the hull of Slave 1. The main floor level runs through Slave 1 and helps to create a datum level from which everything else is built from. Internal frames provide a structural rhythm which the interior components are fitted into. Planning how to divide the hull into sections, I have to consider several factors. I have to be careful not to divide the hull up with a cut through an area of detail which would be difficult to repair. Minimising the number of parts, making printing and assembly as straightforward and reliable as possible, is absolutely crucial. The concept for the assembly is to design Slave 1 much in the same way as a model aircraft. The two halves of the hull will be built independently, and their detailed interiors added before being glued together into one unit. A large section of the floor is then added from underneath, before the underside detail and wings complete the model. Another feature on version 2.0 of Slave 1 is that I've made provision for lighting. The end of the tail has room for a 9 volt battery. LEDs can be fitted along the internal spine, and wiring can be fed down the inner walls through the floor to LEDs in the round and oval engines. This is something I hope to have working on my model. To access the 9 volt battery, the end panel of the tail is removable and can be attached with magnets. I bought these 5 by 2 mm magnets on Amazon and they'll be used not only for the tail, but to help the rotating cockpit stay in its landing or flight positions. I've been having way too much fun playing with these. The original filming model of Slave 1 is over 2 feet long, 2 feet wide and is approximately 1 to 30 scale. This is what I'm working to for my model. From this point you'll be able to scale the parts up or down, depending on how big you want your model. My previous Slave 1 had been printed on an Ultimaker 2 Plus FDM printer, but with resin printers getting bigger and cheaper, I wanted to design Slave 1 to be printed in FDM or resin. As such, I designed my parts to be printed on the Anycubic M3 Max. Its massive build volume and my experience with Anycubic 6K made the M3 Max a no-brainer for me. With this new printer, I was confident I could design and print the main hull of Slave 1 in manageable chunks. I know there are some of you out there who want a decent Slave 1 for 3 and 3 quarter inch figures. Well, if you scale up the parts to 160%, you should be in business. You'll have to print out the hull and other large parts out on an FDM printer, or cut them up in software, but it is possible. If you want to go smaller, 1 to 48 is a good manageable scale, which will make a great model for a diorama. If you do decide to change the scale, you will need to source your own hardware where needed. So how have I divided up Slave 1? Well it is a bit tricky, trying to avoid the internal and external areas of detail, but this is what I've come up with. The hull is split down the centre, into left and a right side, which is then cut into sections. The internal parts are all printed separately, and fixed in place before joining the two halves together. Underside and wing details are then glued in place afterwards. In these images, 
Each individual part for printing is in a different color. In total, there are 134 parts to print, which makes this a very complex model. If you're used to making 3D printed models, you should be fine, but I wouldn't recommend Slave 1 as your first build. Large 3D printed parts need a lot of cleaning up and fitting. Just saying. With the parts broken down, they now need to be debugged for printing. This is my process for preparing the parts. Basically, each part is exported as an STL file, checked in three slicer programs and any errors are corrected and changes are made before a test print is made. Here's an example of a cockpit part with intentional errors in the Ultimaker slicer Cura. The backing disc and front detail should be one green slicer each level. Here they're separate, not good. In the photocentric slicer we get areas showing red and when we rotate the part the back disc is transparent. This is a sign that some of the parts are inside out. Their normals need to be flipped. You can see more about this in my how-to video about 3D CAD design. With the normals flipped, we can check it again. First in Cura, where you can see the slicing now makes a lot more sense. And then in the photocentric slicer. The fixed part will now print without errors, but I'll test print all the parts just to make sure before releasing them for sale. My most concerning parts for test printing were those that made up the main hull. The mass of resin involved could easily distort the part during printing, and this was something I needed to find out just how far I could push the design. I decided it was now time to give my credit card a workout, so I hopped onto Amazon and bought an Anycubic M3 Max. A few days later, and a very heavy box arrived. It looked like it had seen some warehouse action, but I knew Anycubic had a good reputation for packing their printers well, so I wasn't going to panic just yet. My box was only loosely sealed, which did make me suspicious, but I figured Amazon were pretty good about returns if I had an issue, so I decided to crack on. The printer was encased in high density foam and a steel custom cage, so it was well protected. The first thing to do was slide it out of the box, then I could release it from its cage. The protective corner caps just fall off, and you're left with a really solid lump of printer. This thing weighs over 11 kilos, so it's pretty heavy to move around. In the box in the top is all the hardware and tools you need for the printer. An allen key in here is used to take the metal cage apart. Then the high density foam can be lifted clear, finally revealing the printer. Cable ties secure the main body of the printer to the base of the cage. Within the iconic yellow cover, more foam houses a huge vat and build plate. This is a massive chunk of aluminium, weighing in at over 2 kilos. Power leads and the brick are also in here. The printer can now finally be removed from the base tray and the cover installed. Having a removable front cover makes access to the build plate and vat so much easier than the traditional over-the-top covers, which often clash with the back rails. This printer has an auto-feed to keep the resin topped up, but I won't be using that. I'll just manually top up the resin. So, on to my first test print. I decided to try and print a large section of the middle of the hull. This had internal and external detail which made adding support structure would always compromise either the internal or external surfaces. I decided to add primary support to the outside, which would be easier to clean up. This was a 50 hour print, but I wanted to push the printer to highlight any factors I needed to allow for in the design of my parts. The print actually came out really well, leaving internal and external detail clean and well formed. The big problem was the weight and cross-sectional area of the print had caused the print to distort the lower skirt. This print was a failure. After a rethink, I decided to remove the outer detail panel and divide the print into two, as you can see here. The original print was the blue, green and yellow parts in the middle. I was now going to print these separately. With the part laying flat on the build plate, there should be way less distortion than before. 
there'd be quite a lot of support material to clean up inside, but better that than a print fail. 24 hours later, and I had a successful print. Followed by another, and they look like they will fit together. That's so good. It looks like I have a solution for printing the main parts in resin, or on an FDM printer. Now I just have another 132 parts to go. All the parts are now ready for printing, which given the build volume of the M3 Max, shouldn't take too long, as I can print quite a few parts at a time. As I go, I'm making notes on the parts list, to help everyone get the best results possible. In the next video, you'll see how the main hull of Slave 1 starts to take shape, and some of the interior detail will be added. By then, all of the parts should be printed, and I'll be another step closer to releasing the files for sale. I hope you're enjoying Project Slave 1. If you are, please share with your friends, and make sure you subscribe to my channel. So you catch my next video when it goes live, click on the bell icon. To learn about some of the techniques I use, check out my how-to series to find out more about moulding, casting, CAD design and 3D printing. If you have any questions about Project Slave 1, just leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you. Thanks for watching.